Right. Welcome, everyone, uh, back to the Schubert Seminar. Uh, today, we're happy to have Irit Huk Kuruvila from Virginia Tech uh, telling us about quantum clearings of partial flag varieties, Coulomb branches, and the beta ansatz. Please take it away, Irit. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you guys again for uh, inviting me to this seminar. So, um, our goal here is to give a presentation for the quantum K theory ring of the partial flag varieties SLN mod P. And I probably need to tell you what those things mean. So I'll kind of go word by word here. Let's start with defining what's K theory. So it's, think of it conceptually like you would um, the cohomology ring of a variety. It's a similar kind of invariance. And it's, Roughly defined by starting with the um, vector bundles on your space X under direct sum. This is a monoid. You can complete it to a group by formally adding um, negative elements. So we add negative vector bundles, essentially. There's also multiplication coming from tensor product of bundles. So K theory is roughly the... Um, is a ring defined by starting with this um, growth in group of vector bundles and imposing the relation that bundles are additive along short exact sequences. Um, so another thing that this means is that um, if your variety X is smooth, we could also treat this as based on the growth in the group of coherent sheaves instead of vector bundles, because we can take projective resolution. So we can always put our coherent sheaves in terms of some exact sequences involving vector bundles. So we can kind of place them within, within K theory. Um, again, think of this like a cohomology theory. Think of what I just said, like, some version of Poincaré duality. Um, also, in cohomology for compact spaces, you have integration. You can integrate your um, differential forms or push forward to a point. The K-theoretic version of this is taking the um, holomorphic Euler characteristic, which is a alternating sum of the dimensions of the sheaf cohomology. So that means the Poincaré pairing can be written as the holomorphic Euler characteristic of the tensor products in the same way that you can write it by a integration um, in, in cohomology. For those already familiar with K-theory, I have omitted some things. This doesn't make the distinction between algebraic or topological K-theory, and I've only really defined K0. But for all of the... Um, Bases we're considering, flag varieties, these distinctions do not matter. All right, so if you aren't familiar with K-theory, it'll probably make more sense once I give you an example. So we'll work with uh, projective spaces. So let's consider Pn um, and take some hyperplane. By standard theory, we have this exact the following exact sequence of sheaves. What that means is we have an equality in the K theory ring where the structure sheaf of a hyperplane is one minus the uh, tautological bundle O of minus one. And now we have some, we can use this to get some other non trivial relations in in the k-ring. Um, there's a theorem of Sarah that says if you take the like, derived tensor product of structure sheaves, that's equivalent to intersections. So you can use this to argue that 1 minus O of minus 1 to the n plus 1 is equal to 0, because the intersection of n plus 1 hyperplanes is empty. Um, in fact, this relation is enough to completely describe the K-ring of uh, projective space. 
Like with cohomology, you can also work equivariantly. Um, equivariant K theory is just defined by starting with equivariant bundles instead of uh, non equivariant bundles. And it's a module over the equivariant K ring of a point, which is the representation ring of the group. So if we take the n plus 1 torus with its standard action on Pn, the theory of a point is Laurent polynomials in the weights, um, lambda 0 to lambda n. How this affects the previous calculation is each of the n plus 1 coordinate hyperplanes have a different weight. So you have to include that in the O of minus 1. So the resulting relation becomes essentially the same, but each O of minus 1 has a weight attached to it. There are other ways of deriving this, but um, this is the one that kind of matches what we did non-equivariant. OK. So I've told you about K-theory, so I should now tell you about quantum K-theory. And this is going to involve deforming the K-ring using some kind of data about curves in the space we're considering. So if I fix a genus, a, not, a positive integer n, and some kind of curve class inside um, the second homology of x, I can define the Konsevich moduli space mgnd bar x, which, is, which parameterizes maps from genus g nodal curves with n marked points into x, and whose image lies in the homology class given by d. And the space has n maps to x given by evaluating the curve, uh, evaluating the map at each marked point of the curve. It can use the case here of this space to um, answer some enumerative questions about, um, about x. And we do this through a k theoretic Gromov Witten invariants, which are defined as follows. Given some inputs, alpha i in the k theory of x, you pull them all back by the corresponding evaluation maps, and then you take the holomorphic Euler characteristic. You push forward to a point. Again, if you're familiar with usual gromov witten invariants, this is the same thing, except instead of integration, we're doing k-theoretic push forwards. To account for the fact that this moduli space is not smooth, we have this virtual structure sheaf here, but you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't show up in the examples we consider. If each of these alpha i's is actually the structure sheaf of some variety a i, then this invariant we've defined is a represents some vir virtual, whatever that means, count of degree d genus g curves passing through a1 to a n. Basically, we're saying the first marked point has to land in A1, the second marked point has to land in A2, the third marked point has to land in A3, etc. Yeah, these invariants are introduced by Giventhal and Lee as kind of a K theory gener generalization of the uh, um, usual Gromov Witten invariants introduced by Kansevich. Also introduced by Giventhal and Lee is the quantum K ring. Again, if you've seen quantum cohomology, this is the k-theoretic version of that. Um, basically, we, we deform the multiplication in, in k-theory by using the um, gromov witten invariants. This deformation is done over the Novikov ring, which are basically you have variables that are the exponentials of curve classes in H2. So for each degree d, there's an expression in the Novikov variables called q to the d that um, singles out that degree. One, the cleanest way to give a definition is first by modifying the pairing. The, the quantum pairing is given in terms of the two-point Gromov-Witten invariance. Um, 
And then after that, the quantum product is defined in terms of the three-point Gromov-Witten invariance. If you look at them as structure constants with respect to the quantum pairing. So there should be a Q um, in the pairing in the bottom left. What we mean is the degree D part of the um, quantum product of alpha beta paired with gamma is the is the degree D three-point Gromov-Witten invariant alpha beta gamma. Again, if these are structure sheaves, this represents the number of uh, of curves passing through alpha beta gamma of degree D and genus zero. Okay, what does this look like in an example? If x is pn, there is um, one Novikov variable q and powers of it. Q corresponds to the class of a line. And so our relation before 1 minus O of minus 1 to the n plus 1 equals 0 ends up becoming 1 minus O of minus 1 to the n plus 1 equals Q. This is, um, in quantum cohomology, there's kind of a nice enumerative explanation for this here. It's not quite so obvious, but this ends up what, being what you get. Equivariantly, the modification is the same as for the non-quantum case. You insert your weights on each O of 1. These are hard to compute, harder to compute than quantum cohomology, so we do not have that many other examples. So today we'll talk about flag varieties in type A. And geometrically, they're moduli space of increasing chains of subspaces v1 up to v small n inside c big n with prescribed dimensions of each subspace. So if there's only one subspace and it has dimension k, this is the Grassmannian. Um, this is going to be the main example we'll focus on, even though the results here make sense for all flags. Um, uh, since this is a Schubert seminar, you probably prefer to think of these as SLN mod some parabolic subgroup. But today, we're going to um, think of them slightly differently. Um, rather, we'll think of these as GI2 quotients of vector spaces by some reductive groups. In this case, uh, for flags, it will be this some space of matrices um, quotiented by some product of uh, GLNs. The idea here is imagine uh, if I go back to these in writing expressing each of these inclusions of subspaces as a matrix, and then quotienting out by how many ways you can change coordinates. This is a GIT quotient, which is why there are two slashes here. And what that means is we first throw out some unstable locus, and then we take the quotient. In this case, the unstable locus is maps that are not injective, so which makes sense because we don't have an inclusion of subspaces if the corresponding um, matrix defines an, a map that's not injective. Um, again, for the Grassmannian, there's only one matrix here because there's one subspace. It's n by k matrices, and the group is GLK. So if you haven't seen this before, just think about that. So from, from this description, we can develop some of the geometry of these flag varieties. So the bundle VI, I mean, sorry, the subspace VI at each point determines a bundle on the flag called SI. And the curve classes here are dual to the first turn class of the determinant of SI, and the, we label the Novikov variables QI. So for the Grassmannian, there's only one. And this, the action of the n-torus on Cn in, introduces an action on the flag. Um, and we always work equivariantly with respect to that action. Again, since this, this is the Schubert seminar, I should say that if you want to understand the k-theory of the flag, one way to do this is by doing Schubert calculus. Um, you can, it's generated by the structure sheaves of your Schubert varieties. Um, and the associated polynomials are growth unique polynomials, and they have 
and there's a whole theory of this that is analogous to the usual Schubert calculus in cohomology. Um, but again, I'm not going to use this dis this description, unfortunately. Um, here's how I'm going to describe the uh, the K theory of the flag. Um, using the lambda y class, it lambda y class to the vector bundle is the um sum of the wedges wedge powers of the vector bundle weighted by y to the i. Um, depending on conventions, there's a minus sign here. Um, attached to the y. And this is multiplicative on exact sequences. That means we have the formula lambda y of si is the same times lambda y of si plus 1 over si is equal to lambda y of si plus 1. This is not very interesting, but if you take the, the wedge powers of si and si plus 1 over si as generators, the, these equations actually give you a complete presentation for the k-ring of the flag. Here, s n plus 1 is c n, and this is equivariantly is the sum of the equivariant parameters. So this presentation also works equivariantly. OK. So again, we're going to focus on the Grassmannian because it means um, I can write more understandable equations. So the Grassmannian, there's only one tautological bundle and one quotient. And this one equation here determines the uh, determines all of the uh, relations in the K theory of the Grassmannian if you take each power of y separately. Okay. Um, another kind of warning: we're sometimes going to write classes in terms of churn roots. So. Um, these bundles S, I guess there's just one over the Grassmannian, they don't uh, they don't split into sums of line bundles, but we can kind of pretend they do, and we'll call the pretend direct summands churn roots, and here we'll label them by PJ. They don't mean anything in the K theory of X, but you can take any symmetric function of the churn roots of a bundle will define a legitimate class in the K theory of X. So for the Grassmannian, if we take the um, Lth elementary symmetric polynomial of uh, these of these P's, we will get the Lth wedge of S. This this um, this is something that's true for bundles that split and also. In terms of churn roots, we're kind of extending it to bundles that don't split. If you haven't seen this construction before, imagine pulling back to some bigger variety where the bundle splits and working there. OK. So now that we've established some things about the usual K theory, we're going to talk about some predictions for the quantum K theory. So one of these is the uh, Whitney presentations, which are based on a deformation of the Whitney sum formula that we gave previously. Um, these are conjectured by Gu, Mihalcha, Sharp, Xu, Zhang, and Zhou. And, um, and they're written as follows for a general flag. If you specialize all of your QIs to zero, we'll get back the equation that I wrote previously. These conjectures are proven by the same authors for instance varieties and by a subset of these authors for um, for Grassmannians, but they're not they weren't known for the uh, remaining kinds of uh, partial flex. Um, again, we're sticking to the Grassmannian and. Um, this Q should be capital, but this is what the thing looks like for there. And one way of obtaining this conjecture that's in the paper that introduces it but is by starting with some ideas from physics and that which gives you some 
equations that are predicted to be something about quantum cave theory, and then modifying them to get a nice geometric presentation, which is what the authors did. The physical idea here comes from the Coulomb branch of a particular gauge linear sigma model. Um, what that means is, to me at least, because I'm not a physicist, they have some superpotential W. Um, then they have some parameter called a churn simons level that you that they tune specifically to get to um, quantum K theory. And then after doing that, the critical locus of the superpotential gives you equations that I've written down here in terms of the churn roots. The physical prediction is that if you take some symmetric combination of these equations, they will give you relations in the uh, quantum K theory of the of the Grass model, or more generally, if you do this in the more general setting of the partial flag. How do you how do you get symmetric combinations? This is again a clever trick by the authors of the the conjecture. They observe that the we have one equation for each turn root, but they're all kind of the same. You can say that each turn root is the root of this polynomial f, which has symmetric coefficients. And then you can get um, symmetric relations by using Vieta's formulas for, um, the, for the polynomial f that computes symmetric functions of the roots in terms of the coefficients. I won't do this explicitly, but trust me that you can rearrange these Vieta relations into the Whitney presentation. OK, there's one more prediction. Um, this comes from representation theory and quantum integrable systems. Um, there are some very general conjectures regarding Nakajima quiver varieties that um, specialize to relating the K-theory of the cotangent bundles of the flags to a quantum integrable system called the XXZ spin chain. Um, Certain authors, Kurdiev, Pushkar, Smirnov, and Zeitlin, have uh, answered some of these conjectures with the caveat that they're not using stable map quantum K theory. They've defined a version of quasi map quantum K theory where you where some of these connections are shown to hold. Um, this is using a different moduli space than Konsevich's and a different method for deforming the uh, the K ring. Their theory has a compact limit to the case of the flag itself, not just the cotangent bundle, and they define this ring I'm calling QKQM. Um, but again, this is a quantum K ring in the in this quasi map language. So um, it's unknown whether this corresponds to the stable map quantum K ring that uh, people are initially interested in or not. They were able to prove it for the case of the full flag, but um, it wasn't known for um, for partial flags. I do not have the time to explain all of this, uh, the stuff about quantum integrable systems to you, nor do I fully understand it. So I'll give you the description that um, of the quasi-map ring without saying too much about where it comes from. So to do that, I should first explain uh, how fixed point localization works. For the Grassmannian, you can write the K-theory, if you're working equivariantly, in terms of the K-theory of all of the T fixed points. Um, each of those is a point, so that's isomorphic to um, the representation ring of the torus. The restriction of uh, some class in terms of the churn roots to a particular fixed point is determined by setting each churn root to be some equivariant parameter. You can't um, you can't set them to the two different churn roots to the same parameter. You can think of it as choosing k roots of the equation t mi product i t minus lambda i. The quasi map description. Um, yeah, the description of the quasi-map k-ring is also in these terms. So 
what they do is they have these quantum tautological bundles, which are some Q deformations of the class's tau of P. And their restrictions to the class of a fixed point is determined by tau applied to the roots of a different equation, which in this language of uh, quantum integral systems is the beta ansatz equation. And for Grassmannians, it looks as follows. Hopefully this should be familiar. This is the same thing as the uh, Coulomb branch equation. This is, I think this observation has been made by a few people, um, but it kind of suggests the idea that there's some intrinsic meaning to this equation, right? It's not super surprising if this were just a relation in the quantum K ring, then you'd have two different predictions of the quantum K ring gives you the same relations. That's not, you know, that's not the most surprising thing in the world, but these aren't relations. They're things you use to get relations by some kind of symmetrization. So it's maybe more surprising that you see the same equation in these di vastly different contexts. So really maybe this suggests that these equations mean something geometrically themselves, not just what you get when you symmetrize them. And that's basically the question I answer here, that um, these equations have a geometric interpretation. They come from the abelianization of the flag. I'll tell you what that is later. And as corollaries of these results, we, have, we can get a proof of the Whitney relations for all flag varieties, and we get an isomorphism between the uh, quantum k-ring of the flag and the quasi-map quantum k-ring. And this isomorphism tells you something about these quantum tautological bundles, which are otherwise a little bit mysterious. Um, the next part of the talk is how we arrive at some of these results and what they mean. So before that, I think it's a good time to uh, take a break. Very good, thank you. Uh, so let's let's take a break of five minutes. Uh, so I'll see everyone at five o three.